In this video, we will discuss the interpolation method for simulating numerical dynamic responses. This is also known as the piecewise exact method because it will provide an exact solution given that its assumption is, is correct. This is a great place to start because it builds directly off of techniques we presented in the previous unit on arbitrary loading. It's always good to start from the fundamental assumptions of any of these numerical methods. And so let's do that for interpolation. As with any numerical approach, we know the loading time history, which we will call P of T. All right, so that will consist of a set of discrete points. Let's take four in this case. What we're trying to find is the displacement response in this case, U of T. Now for argument's sake, let's say we've solved for the response up to some time instance Ti. This means that we know all the response values up to that point, but we have yet to find the remaining points. And let's call the value at the time instance Ui, following our convention, and we'll call the force at that time instance Pi. The next force we'll call Pi plus 1, and the next displacement we'll call Ui plus 1. So the challenge here is determining Ui plus 1 from the known values that we have, Ui, Pi, Pi plus 1. The fundamental assumption that the interpolation method makes is that the force in between these two time instances is linear. Hence, we interpolate between the two known values of the force. This means that we can actually obtain an analytical function, P of t, for the force between those two points. This turns the problem back into an analytical problem, because now we actually have a continuous function, P of t, which means that we can solve for the response using ui as initial conditions and solve for a time interval delta t, which we know. The approach we will take is outlined here, and it consists very similar to an approach that we discussed in unit four, where we try to describe the load as a combination of steps, ramps, and free vibration conditions. So if we're at time instance i, the first thing we will do is look at the initial conditions at that point. And we will add a free vibration component due to those initial conditions. This is our first equation one. So essentially what we're doing is we're assuming no force, but we are adding initial conditions to the system based on the response properties at that point. The displacement ui and the velocity u dot i. Next, we, we add a component for step force, which describes this rectangular portion of the force here. That is our function two. Okay, in this case, we ignore initial conditions and simply simulate a step force with a magnitude corresponding to the value of the force at i. And then lastly, we add a ramp to account for the linear change in force from i to i plus one. And that is this function number three, which is a ramp starting at zero at i and going to a value of pi plus 1 minus pi, essentially the change in p. And again, we are using zero initial conditions for this case. Now, for the sake of example, we'll consider an undamped system with a time variable tau, which relates to the absolute time t by a shift of ti. Okay, in other words, tau starts at time ti. This is simply to get into a form that we have dealt with before. So tau starts at zero and ends at delta t. 
using that variable, now we can model u of tau as a free vibration response. This, of course, corresponds to equation one and has, in place of the initial conditions, the values ui and u dot i. We add to this the response to the step force, which, if you remember, for undamped systems would look like this. This is our equation for two. And then finally, we add an equation for the ramp response. And this corresponds to equation three. So now we have an analytical response for the time period i to i plus 1. So the last thing left to do is to solve for our response at time i plus 1. And that is equivalent to saying the function u of tau evaluated at delta t, which will give us u i plus 1. So all we need to do is plug in tau equal to delta t into the function we derived before to get the equation that you see here. All right, so let's look at what is known and what is unknown. Everything marked in green is known. In other words, we know all the u's that have subscript i's because that's our current time step. In addition, we know all the forces. And of course, we know our time interval delta t. The only thing that we don't know is that u with the subscript i plus 1. And conveniently, the equation is set up in a way where we can solve for it directly. In order to make this equation easier to implement as an algorithm, we can recognize that the quantities omega n, k, and delta t are fixed. In other words, they don't change iteration to iteration. So we can rearrange the equation in terms of the quantities that actually do change, which are these here. So our final algorithm equation looks something like a sum of coefficients times each of those variables. And those coefficients are defined directly from the previous equation. These coefficients a, b, c, and d only need to be calculated once before the algorithm can be run. Now in developing this algorithm, we've made the assumption that we know ui and u dot i initially. Right? So in order to actually start this up, we need some seed values for the very first values of ui and u dot i, which will be u0 and u dot 0. And this is where we feed in our initial conditions. So in the case of a stationary system, before loading, we can simply set these two to zero in order to be able to start the algorithm. Now, the coefficients that we just derived were for an undamped system. We can do the same for a damped system to get the coefficients that you see here. These again are defined in terms of fixed quantities now including zeta and omega d. But again, we can solve for these once before implementing the algorithm. Now, a through d, again, are used for finding the value of i plus 1. In this case, I've also included a prime through d prime, which are used in the same way, but give u dot i plus 1. So you can solve for both displacement and velocity at the next time step, which remember, you need both to keep stepping through. So in summary, the key assumptions for the interpolation method are that we have a linear forcing function, a continuous forcing function from ti to ti plus 1, and that we can use superposition of inputs and outputs to solve for the response to that linear function. Now, superposition should be a dead giveaway that this only works for linear systems, or at least systems that can be linearized in that time interval. One of the great characteristics of this approach is that assuming that the forcing function is indeed linear between the two time instances, the solution actually is exact. So the only error comes from how much the fo actual force deviates from that assumption.
In addition, it's fairly quick to implement and the coefficients are easy to define and only need to be defined once before you can implement the algorithm. However, it can be difficult to implement in a multi-degree of freedom case, which we won't cover here, but again, moving forward, it's important to understand that this method does not scale up extremely well.